So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Peter, who's kindly come along. Peter is the emeritus professor of, uh, an, ex, an emeritus professor of political philosophy from Newcastle University. And uh, I'm sure he's kept up to date with the <laughs> latest developments in populism. So you don't need this, Peter. No, right. <coughs> well, thank, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? All right, OK. Um, I asked Mike to introduce me as a professor of political philosophy, which is what I am. I'm not a political scientist. Maybe that means nothing to you, but it means I know about ideas. I'm not so strong on facts, but we'll, we'll see. Um, well, we hear an awful lot these days about populism. Um, we're most aware of it, I guess, through the election of Donald Trump, but of course also through Brexit. But populist parties, populist movements have become very widespread through Europe. So there's a list of some of the right-wing populist parties in Europe. And I'm not expecting you to read that, absorb it. I'm just trying to give some impression of how widespread it is. And the fact that list is far from comprehensive. If it was comprehensive, it would be at least twice as long. Now, those are right-wing populist parties, but populism also has its left-wing variants. So in, in Greece, Syriza, which came to power after the, the crash in 2008, that's generally characterized as a populist left-wing movement. Similarly, Podemos, which arose in 2014 in Spain, following a protest, that also places itself on the left. And populism has a long tradition in Latin America. And all the best known variants of that are also on the left. Now, um, Juan Perón and his wife Evita, uh, very well known. Um, there is some controversy as to whether they should, put, should be put on the right or on the left. The truth is that the crude left-right distinction doesn't always capture people easily in the populist area. But more recently, uh, in Bolivia, the regime of Evo Morales in Ecuador, Rafael Correa, and probably the best known one in Venezuela, Hugo Chavez. Chavez was president of uh, Venezuela uh, from 1999 to 2013. Um, he described himself as a Bolivarian, a follower of Simon Bolivar, the liberator of Latin America from colonial rule, but also as a Marxist. Now, that gives rise to a puzzle about populism. How can there be an ism, populism, that is shared by people that occupy such vastly different political positions? And there's another puzzle. Um, populism is generally a pejorative term. It's a condemnatory term. It condemns what it describes. On the whole, people don't describe themselves as populists. There are some exceptions, but usually populism is what other people call them. Now, populists are concerned with concern for the power of the people, hence the word. But we normally consider the power of people to be democracy. And democracy, we think, is generally a good thing. So how do they sense of that. Um, how can populism be a boo word, like, like fascist, when democracy is an hooray word? And does it simply come down to this? Well, sorry, let me preface that by a quote. Thomas Hobbes, the famous 17th century political philosopher, he described tyranny as merely monarchy misliked. So if you don't like a king, you call him a tyrant, but he's still a king. Well, is it the case that populism is merely democracy misliked, or is there more to it? Now, can I ask, um, did anybody hear, uh, hear Melvin Bragg's In Our Time this morning? Ah, how many people? Well, you had a treat, yes, yeah. The program was on um, the populist party in America, who were in America the very first populists. 
Um, they were very unlike what we come to think of as populism now. Uh, they were a movement, a grassroots movement of poor farmers in the south and the west of the United States. Um, in the period following the Civil War, they had a really hard time making a living. And they blamed their plight on eastern bankers who wouldn't extend them credit or would only high rates, and often banks crashed to their disadvantage, to their detriment. Uh, they also blamed their plight on the railroad owners who had monopolies on the railroads, and of course the farmers were entirely dependent upon them to get their food to market. And so they formed alliances and cooperatives to try and improve their position, and they called for the nationalisation of banks and the nationalisation of the railroads. So what you really had in the first populist, um, in the people whose movement eventually led to the People's Party, was a radical agrarian movement. And their interests, and this is often a feature with, with populism, their interests were simply, or had been, simply ignored by the two big parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. So eventually, the movement gave rise in 1892 to the formation of their own party, the Populist Party, the People's Party. Um, they didn't last for long as a separate party. They couldn't compete with the two mates. They, I mean, they did get some people into Congress, but they were absorbed by the Democratic Party in 1894. An independent element remained, sorry, an element remained independent, but the party was abandoned in 1908. So the People's Party was a fairly short-lived thing, although the movement that gave rise to it was much longer lasting. But I think they're significant for populism in a number of ways. I mean, first of all, they were a genuine mass movement. <coughs> You know, it was a movement that arose from below, from the bottom up. It was very unlike the kind of leader-led populism we've got used to in our day. It also arose out of ordinary people's grievances, which, they, as it were, which separated them off from the establishment, the establishment who ignored them and who existed to their detriment. But it also, of course, it indicates that here, in this case, I think it's fair to say that um, the origin, that the People's Party, populism in its origin, was a left-wing movement, as we, as far as we can use that term. There was some discussion about this morning, but from what I know about them, that is the right characterization. So that's one origin of populism. Now, the other one is the Russian Narodniki, usually translated populist. That's a completely different kettle of fish. It was a movement that developed in the 1860s and became active in the 1870s but it was an entirely intellectual middle-class movement. A bunch of intelligentsia, influenced mainly by Alexander Herzen, wanted to overthrow the Tsarist system to establish a different kind of economy in Russia altogether, and thought that the root of that was getting the peasantry, the people, to rise up and overthrow the system. And so they followed Herzen's slogan, go to the people, and off they went, these intelligence there, into the countryside, to the peasantry to try and get them to revolt against the system. They got short thrift from the peasantry. They discovered the peasantry were conservative, they were acquisitive, they were deeply suspicious of the students, and they very often handed them over to the authorities. And loads of them were actually, these Norodniki were arrested, and in the end they just gave up on the peasantry and turned to terror instead. So that's a very different movement, but again, you see a populist movement that actually is, if anything, in our terms, left being in origin. And they did have some ultimate influence on the Bolsheviks. So that's where historians find the first origins of populism. But in a way, I've mentioned that because it is so different from what we now are now used to as populism. So I want now to go on to, in a sense, answer my question, what is populism? Let me say something, first of all, about the nature of populism as, well, people aren't quite sure what to call it. Um, let me just call it initially an ideology. Now, if it, we do call it an ideology, it's an ideology with a very thin content. It's really not that substantial. 
Um, I mean that in contrasting with things like Marxism or liberalism with a small l, environmentalism, feminism, loads of other isms that have a very strong and varied substance to them. There's not all that much to populism as you'll see. It's also a phenomenon without hard edges. It's often difficult to know quite where it begins and where it ends. And so I think we need to think in terms of degrees of populism. Some people think it should be characterized as a style rather than ide ideology, a way of doing or a way of thinking about politics. Now, the way I'm going to try and handle this is to um, think in terms of a moral case of, po of populism. What are its essentials? What are the general features you find of it? But I have to say that not everybody who would get called a populist would necessarily subscribe to all that I'm going to put in front of you. Right. Now, the first thing, the word populist, it comes from the Latin populus, meaning people, as I'm sure you all know. So that's the first thing that the, the term is supposed to connote. But it doesn't mean people indiscriminately. It means the people conceived as an entity, as the people, a body of citizens in their political role. And secondly, it's always used to refer to a particular people. So American populists are concerned with the American people, Hungarian populists with the Hungarian people, Venezuelan populists with the Ven Venezuelan people. So sometimes, not always, you get an association between populism and nationalism. You know, it's very easy to be talking about a particular people, the people, for that to turn into or to be associated with the nation. Though some populists avoid that term because of the pejorative connotations that nationalism acquired, and Podemus, for example, has abjured, they use the term patriotism instead. Um, now, there's nothing very remarkable in that. Uh, I think we begin to see what is distinct about populism when we see who are not the people in their eyes, and that is the elite. Populists always contrast or counterpose, juxtapose the people to the elite that rules them, that rules their society. Now, how is that elite conceived? Sometimes it's conceived in purely political terms. So the elite of the political class, the ruling class, I think it always includes that group. Sometimes it's conceived rather more broadly, as with the People's Party, to include the economic elite, bankers, big corporations. I mean, very many populists, they're not anti-capitalist, but what they're, they're very much free marketeers, some of them. But what they don't like is, as were, big people, big economic units, big economic actors, who use their power to get control over the government and work things to their advantage and against the interest of the ordinary person. And sometimes it's, well, I think increasingly coming to use also to mark off a cultural elite. So American populists like Donald Trump or uh, the Tea Party, one of their hate groups, as it were, is East Coast liberals. I mean, as you know, liberals in America doesn't mean like liberals it does here. It means social democrats. But it means sort of smart aleck lefty types that live in New York. Some, now they sometimes use the, the term, I haven't got it up here, bi-coastal liberals. And bi-coastal means the lot in New York and those people in California. But in between, you've got real people, middle America. Um, I rather like Sarah Palin's way of characterizing the elite. She says, they're latte drinkers who buy, drive Volvos. <laughs> and that's supposed to contrast with um, people who drink real coffee and who drive real American cars. I mean, something else that goes along with it, there's often in populism a strong anti-intellectual element. A, a lot of emphasis upon the good, honest, common sense of the ordinary people I suppose these fancy, pointy-headed intellectuals, as George Wallace called, called them. And I think, I mean, one manifestation of that is uh, Donald Trump's simple dismissal of global warming. Oh, it's all just a hoax. 
Oh, I'm just stunning, ignorant bravado. I, I don't. I'm, of course, some people have good reason for doubting global warming, but I'm damn sure Trump knows step to nothing about it. But that doesn't stop him. It's just you can just brush it aside. No, so um, the elite is not really different from, distinguished from the people. They're also presenting as opposed to the people. So they're characterized very frequently as the enemies of the people. Typically, in populist rhetoric, thinking, the elite are characterized as privileged, distant, corrupt, self-serving, exploitative, pursuing their own interests and values rather than the people's. And again, I'll cite Trump. I think this very well-known phrase he used captures that thinking or that idea very well. He's going to drain the swamp in Washington, this fetid, corrupt thing there is there. And that was sort of anticipated by Ross Perot. Um, I'm old enough to remember him, and I think many other people are here too, um, who was an independent who insisted himself in a presidential election in 1993. Um, but then pulled out like he always done, did before. So there's something, it's time to pick up a shovel and clean out the barn of all that manure. That's the subtext of it. In the so um, here's a definition of populism from uh, Edward Schultz. Actually, it's quite an old definition, but I think it still stands out quite well. He says it's an ideology of popular resentment against the order imposed on a society by a long-established, differentiated ruling class which is believed to have a monopoly of power, property, breeding, and culture. Now, let me say something about that in relation to representative democracy. Um, I mean, since I'm in the academic trade, I'm never sure how far the terms are generally known that, that we, we use. Um, does everyone know the distinction between indirect and direct democracy? We'll, we'll just, uh, well, let me just explain. Um, direct democracy um, simply means the people actually governing themselves. So a referendum is an exercise in direct democracy. What the ancient Greeks had was direct democracy. They would go to the assembly themselves and vote on issues, the same issues as they voted on Parliament, but in the cabinet and so on in our world. Uh, we don't have that. What we're said to have is indirect democracy. That is, we're not, it's not the people governing themselves. It's the people being governed by those they elect, their representatives. Now, in that indirect form of democracy, um, the role of parties is crucial because political parties provide the link between the people and the government. Who gets to be in the government? A political party but it gets that by competing for the people's vote. And that's supposed to maintain the link between the government and the people. Now, given that, you might say, what are these populists on about? Um, we, we have either two-party or multi-party democracies, and there isn't an elite. There are competing elites. But they would say that not a bit of it, because you have ostensible competition, but it really... It's competition within the elite. Let me go back to Shields' definition, where he speaks of a differentiated ruling class. That is, there are differences within and competition within the ruling class, but the conception is it's still within the ruling class. So there's still a ruling class. There's Tweedledee and Tweedledum, although not so much in this last election. They're actually controlling things. Now, along with that castigation, that hostility to the elite, goes a kind of glorification of the people. The people are conceived as pure and incorruptible. Here's Hugo Chavez, just as an example. All individuals are subject to error and seduction, but not the people, which possess to an eminent degree a consciousness of its own good and the measure of its independence. Notice the use of it's not there. The people is conceived this kind of unitary thing. Because of this, its judgment is pure. Its will is strong 
and none can corrupt or even threaten it. And that goes along with the idea of the people as a homogeneous, homogeneous entity, a unitary entity with a single unitary will. Now here I want to mention Jean-Jacques Rousseau's idea of the general will, because I think populists often think in similar terms to Rousseau. Rousseau was an 18th century uh, political theorist, very influential, very important to French revolutionary thinking, and most famous for his idea of the general will, which I'll now try to explain as briefly as I can. Um, Rousseau said, let's suppose we have a community, he thought a small community, um, that's reasonably homogeneous. It lives a common life, and the people there are much the same. In a community like that, those people will share our common good. You know, they're members of the same community, they share the same fate as members of that community, and what's good for that community must be good for them as members of that community. Now, given you have that community with a shared common good, everybody in the community must want that common good because it's for their good. You know, it would be a nonsense for there to be a common good that people didn't actually want. Or as Rousseau put it, they will the common good. Now that's what he means by the general will. A general will is simply a will general to the people for their common good. Okay, how do we find out what this general will is? Well, Rousseau said if you have democracy, and he meant direct democracy, under the right conditions, we can rely upon the majority to discern what the general will is. You have a vote, and maybe the people aren't unanimous. Ideally, they would be, but maybe they won't be. You have a majority-minority split but you can rely on the majority to get the right answer. And in those circumstances, it's not that the minority have a different will, a different wish from the majority, they've just made a mistake. They've honestly tried to judge the general will, but they've made a mistake. They really want the same as the majority. So everybody falls in line behind the same general will, everybody's happy. Now, that's obviously a controversial idea, but I won't say much more about it. I just want to add one thing to that. And that is, Rousseau recognised this was a highly idealised notion, and that in real life, things were often corrupted. And one possible corruption is that you have within the community a faction, a group, who pursues not the general will, but their particular will their own factional self-interest against the interest of the people. Now, I don't know how many populists have ever read Rousseau, but he's a very influential figure. Even if they don't know of Rousseau, of course, people will be capable of being influenced by his ideas um, because they pass on from thinker to thinker, thought to thought. Um, but what they share, I think, very often with, with Rousseau is this idea of the people as this homogeneous entity with a single will, and of course the populist leader claims to articulate that will. And they also have this idea of there being factions who get in the way of that corrupt the general will of the people, which of course is the elite. Now, um, of course, what's wrong with that idea is, as I said, Rousseau was thinking of a as a small homogeneous community. He was thinking of a city-state like Geneva in his own time, where you could have a direct democracy, you had a very small unified community. He was not thinking of modern states where you have populations numbered in millions and which are very diverse. I mean, he, in fact, he, he said in, in a state as it in his own time, France, for example, or Britain, democracy was impossible. Forget the general will. Um, and that is something which populism is often criticised for, for, for deliberately ignoring the pluralistic character of modern societies. Modern societies, modern democratic societies, are not, of course, homogeneous. They are plural. People have different identities, different interests, different values, different all sorts of ways. 
And somehow a democratic system has to kind of cope with all this, but it's simply false to pretend there's a single homogeneous unit with a single will. Um, so, which just so, that, so that populism is not just anti-elite, but also anti-pluralist, and rather more obviously vulnerable to attack because it's anti-pluralist. The danger in all that, of course, is that populism becomes exclusionary. That is, some people get inc defined into the people, other people are kept out of it. Um, here's an example, uh, Recep Erdogan, the president of Turkey, who I think is particularly given to this, addressing his critics. We are the people, who are you? In other words, his critics, people who don't agree with him, he speaks for the people, don't count as the people. Well, Donald Trump, in a rally in May 2016, the only important thing is the unification of the people because the other people don't mean anything. Now, I'm not sure who the other people were. No, I suppose they're the New York liberals, but um, you, you, know, you get that very dangerous disposition. And of course, another manifestation of the same thing is what's sometimes called nativism. The people mean what I consider as the indigenous people, the true people of the country. Outsiders, asylum seekers, migrants, so on, don't count. They're outside the people. I mean, another manifestation of that was um, McCarthyism, um, the idea of some people being just un-American. And in some instances, um, only some, pop populism gets associated with anti-Semitism. Um, in Hungary and in Bulgaria, some uh, populists have claimed that the, the elite is really governed, that governs their countries, is governed by sympathy with Israel and by Zionist parties. Now that is populism in um, more or less in model form. Oh, sorry, I've, yeah, no, no, let me go, I've forgotten something, yes. One other thing. Now, I think one other thing that comes out of that way of thinking is um, a hostility to anything that gets in the way of the, of the people. And that means a hostility to what we tend to call liberal democracy. Um, liberal democracy is a form of democracy in which the will of the people or the will of the majority is constrained in various ways to secure people's liberty, to secure certain rights and to protect minorities. I think that's clearest, it's much clearer in the American system than in the British system. In America you have a written constitution where power is divided between um, the legislature, legislature and the executive, the presidency, unlike this country, and there's very definitely a separate judiciary. You have division between the two houses of Congress, you have further division between the federal government and the state governments, and in particular you have uh, the Bill of Rights, although of course we now have the European Convention. And that Bill of Rights constrains what anybody can, how anybody can use their political power. It has to be within the constraints set by the Bill of Rights. Who interprets that Bill of Rights is typically the judiciary, a court. And you do find populists being deeply impatient with that kind of constraint upon the people. You've already seen it with Trump and his run-ins with the courts. Now, you know, presidents often fall foul of rulings by the Supreme Court, but what I think is unusual is an attempt to denigrate the judiciary as a consequence of that. You had the same thing with Berlusconi, um, who had his run -ins with, and he pledged to make the necessary reforms to guarantee that a magistrate, a, judici a judge, will not be able to try illegitimately to destroy someone who has been elected by the citizens. It's got to be the people over the judiciary. Something else that falls in the same category is rejecting the legitimacy of oppositional politics. I mean, we think of opposition, criticism of government, party competition as, as the essence of democracy. But often in populism, that is rejected because once you think in terms of the people and the enemies of the people, then for the populace, the people who disagree with him are enemies of the people. They're not a legitimate opposition, the kind of thing you get with Erdogan. And you get frequent attacks on the media. Again, you've seen this with Trump. 
Um, unless, of course, it's their own media, which is called the true of Berlusconi. Um, Jörg Herder, a um, leader of the Austrian Freedom Party, was very well known for his attacks on the media. He attacked the media repeatedly, except the one tabloid that had supported him. Well, that um, is a very general sketch of populism. I think you can see now why it's described as a thin ideology. It really doesn't come down to a lot more than the idea of the people versus the elite, the glorification of the people, and the demonization of the elite. It's also why you find populism conjoined to other isms. So people are very often populist plus something else. The three things I've got there. Um, although I don't think it's entirely an accident that populism has become joined to these other isms. Let me make clear what I'm trying to say here. I'm not saying that to be a socialist is to be a populist or to be a Eurosceptic is to be a populist. That is wrong. But you can see why, if somebody is populistically minded, it gets, can, might get deployed in the case of socialism because a clear difference between, as it were, the economic elite that dominates and the ordinary people who are trying to get into power and to, to displace that elite so they can live in a more egalitarian society. Similarly, with nativism and nationalism, or anti-immigrant parties, um, I, mean, I think there are two things there which would have led to the link between populism and anti-immigration parties. One is the simple business that the people are something other than the migrants who want to come in and who are going to actually devalue the culture of the people and actually devalue their economic condition. But also because of the evident split there has been on immigration between the way the elites view immigration and the way ordinary people view immigration. There's been this pattern across Europe that for many ordinary people, immigration is an issue in a way it has not been for the elites who governed, governed them. And the elite, as it were, simply dismissed the ordinary people's thinking as xenophobic and racist. And I'll say a bit more about that later on. Again, I think the lick to Euroscepticism is no accident. Um, if you're a Popland, you want the people to be sovereign, to be dominant, to be in control of their own affairs. You're therefore going to be hostile to external rule by a body like the European Union, particularly when it takes a bureaucratic, technocratic character. And there, too, of course, you get the same split between um, ordinary people thinking on this thing and the elites, which we saw in Brexit. Now, just a word on how populism gets mobilised. I've been talking about populism in very general terms, but, but who does populism as well? Who gets it into operation? Well, various units, various actors, first of all, leaders. Now, populism has come to be associated with strong, charismatic leading figures. You know, Peron, Chavez, Morales, Hirt, Wilders, uh, Pim Fortine, Erdogan, Hugo Bossi in the Northern League, and so there's a whole load of them. And in a way, that's a paradox. Here you have something which is at the people, and yet the most prominent actor is this rather overbearing leader. Um, of course, the explanation for that is that if the people are going to get anywhere, typically they need to be organized, they need to be led. Paul Taggart, a writer on populism, says that populism requires the most extraordinary individual to lead the most ordinary of people. And I think th that sort of indicates the trick that a populist leader has got to perform, that he has to be extraordinary in a way to justify being the leader of the people, claiming to actually speak for them. On the other hand, he has to be, at least pretend to be ordinary, an ordinary Joe like the common people, so he can claim to embody what they want to speak for, for them. So you get Sarah Palin, for example, presenting herself as just your average hockey mom. Um, Chavez presenting himself as a poor kid, a farm kid from a very poor family, and claiming to be exactly like you and his people. To be fair to Chavez, he was a poor kid from a poor background. Um, but what was significant was the way he harped on that to, to establish his credibility. Um, 
The, but the other thing about this is, um, as it were, the, the people who don't fit that, I mean, here you have Donald Trump, mm -hmm. the, the billionaire, um, claiming to be you know, the people's champion, the poor sods in the rust belt who are unemployed and uh, scratching to get by. And people like Berlusconi, the media, media empire owner, um, speaking, claiming to speak for the people. One thing that some commentators notice about these leaders is they're, how they're given to rather coarse behavior, often bad language, flighty convention, and being deliberately politically incorrect. And of course, what that's all about is trying to make themselves like the ordinary people as they see it. You also get populist parties. Um, of course, you need more than just a leader to get continuity. Very often, however, populist parties in the, um, in the contemporary world are parties really built about around a single leader. They're very monolithic parties. They're very they're top-down parties. I think perhaps the best example of that is Geert Wilders, the um, uh, leader of the People's Freedom Party in the Netherlands. And for some reason, I don't really understand, he is legally the only member of that party. And all of his deputies are just told what to do by him in a very kind of unpopulist way. Um, social movements, populist social movements, like the, the movement that eventually led to the People's Party, are much rarer. I think because they're much more difficult to kind of get to happen and to make work. Um, but there are some examples in the modern year. The best example, I think, is the Tea Party movement in America, which is a quite remarkable phenomenon, which is associated with the Republican Party, but not part of it, and sometimes in opposition to it. And that manages to exist as a kind of loose network rather than some organized hierarchy. Now, um, in Europe, I think for the most part, populist parties have been challenger parties. They've not got power themselves, but they've sort of challenged the established parties. And of course, they've often had considerable influence in that role. Just think of UKIP as influence on putting the EU and migration on the agenda, and of course, getting its way in the last referendum. But there are sometimes populist regimes. Now, people sometimes say that's a contradiction in terms. If populism is about the people versus the elite, how can the populist become the elite and still be a populist? And I think there's two answers to that. One is that sometimes populist parties cease to be populist once they get control. I heard uh, just a few nights ago, I heard Robert Peston describe the DUP as a populist party. And I couldn't really make sense of that, but I think he might have meant this, that in his origins, when um, Ian Paisley got it going, you can conceive it as populist because a rising of some of the ordinary politicians against the established of the Unionist Party and eventually displacing it. But I don't think you can say the DUP now is a populist party. It doesn't fit whatever else you think about it. It doesn't fit that model. The, the same is true, I understand, of Syriza. Now it's sort of in the governing coalition and caved into the Troika's demands of um, uh, austerity in Greece. It's really given up its populist rhetoric. But the other kind of case is where, uh, in a sense, the, the populist takes over and goes on being a populist. Very often you have populist uh, regimes taken in an authoritarian form. Uh, where the leader is seen as implementing the people's will. Chavez regime, for example, took that form. So did Perón. And they keep up this rhetoric of there always been an elite out there, an enemy out there, the oligarchy out there that threatens their position. Well, now the, the, um, the final part of my question, how far should we worry about this? Actually, I think because time's going on, um, I won't bother to point out what's objectionable about populism because I think it's fairly obvious from what I said. I'll just be going over old ground. But um, lots of people think it's a perversion of democracy. The homogeneous people is 
a nonsense. Let, let me just say in qualification that I don't think the idea of there being a common good is always wrong, even in large societies. There are certain ways in which everybody in Britain shares a common good, to live in a secure society, a healthy society, and so on and so on. It's just too simple for me to think that everything is like, like that. Demonising opposition, threatening minorities, and I should have had it, I think, really offering uh, really attractive but simple-minded solutions to what are really complex problems. But I think perhaps the more interesting question is, is there anything to be said in defence of populism? And I just want to suggest a, a couple of things that might be said um, in mitigation, as it were, let me put it like that. Um, one is exposing issues within liberal democracy that are real issues, and the other is um, indicating some kind of shortfall in the democratic system. So let me take the first of those. Now, one writer on populism, the Dutch political scientist, Cass Mudd, has said this, populism has essentially become an illiberal democratic response to an undemocratic liberalism. And what he really means by that I mean, is in liberal democracies, sometimes the balance has switched too much to the liberal and away from the democratic, and you've had a democratic reaction against that. Now, I think that's a real issue. I want to illustrate it by way of, of bills of rights, because I think it's just more easily explained in that way. Um, America has its Bill of Rights, and we, since 1950, have been part subject to the European Convention on Human Rights. All the 1998 Human Rights Act really changed was that up until 1998, you had to go to Strasbourg to, to sue for your human rights. After 1998, you could sue in British courts, although our Supreme Court in this respect is not supreme. Ultimately, it's the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Now, the Bill of Rights in the European Convention lay down rights which give people certain securities. The technical legal term for them is immunities because they make you immune from political power in the matters on which you have rights. They're often called minority rights, but that's misleading. Typically, they're rights held by all citizens, but they get called minority rights because as in a democratic context, you most need them when you're in the minority, when you're, as were, at the mercy of a democratic majority. Now, how do those rights relate to democracy? Well, some of them are rightly called democratic rights. Most obviously the right to vote, but the right to free expression, the right to freedom of assembly, because they're about the very operation of democracy. If a majority deprives a minority of its right to vote, the system would thereby become undemocratic. But most of the rights are non-democratic, in that they're nothing to do about the operation of democracy. So think of rights like the right to a fair trial, to freedom of religion, the right to marry, the right to divorce, the right to found a family, the right to privacy, the right not to be subject to cruel and unusual punishment. They're non-democratic, not in that they're anti-democratic, but they're just not about democracy. And that shouldn't surprise us. Democracy matters to us. Democracy, we think, is a good thing, but it's not the only good thing. Other things also matter to us. I don't think any of us want to be entirely at the mercy of political power, including democratic political power. But that does create issues. Just how far should the demos, the people, be shackled by these rights? Who's going to determine what those rights are? And perhaps more to the point, who's going to administer and interpret what they mean? When you look at the European Convention, what you find is rights that are very generally, very vaguely formulated. So it matters a great deal who is going to determine what they mean in particular cases, and that is courts. And that is why you constantly get conflicts arising between what the politicians want to do, what they know is popular, and what the courts decide, which restrains them. Now that, um, <coughs> I'm not here arguing against rights, I'm very much a fan of of human rights. But there is a big issue there of how far we want or think um, a system should shackle the demos by that, in that kind of way, and how far it should let the people decide and do what they want. How far the people should, in other words, be sovereign. 
And of course, you get the same kind of issue arising with the EU. How far should a society cede powers to some supranational body outside itself? So all I'm trying to say here is that I think populism, rather than just being gratuitous when it challenges liberal democracy, is exposing things which are real issues within liberal democracy. Now, the second issue is, or the second point, is rather different. And here I want to quote um, Lena de, I'm not sure how you pronounce the name, de, de Jong or de, de Jong or Jonger. Populism is not a disease. It is a symptom of a democratic system that is ailing. There is nothing inherently undemocratic about populism. In small doses, it can act as a political corrective. And the idea there is that really, look, if you get, I mean, populist leaders can only function as populist leaders if they get a following, if they tap into people's grievances. And if you get those grievances developing and being exploited by populists, that means they're not being noticed, they're not being attended to by the democratic system. So um, we may think Donald Trump is a joke, but what about the people who voted for him? We may just dis be dismissive of some of them. Hillary Clinton called them the deplorables. I mean, to be fair to Hillary, uh, she's called half of them deplorables. The others weren't so bad. Um, but I worry about that dismissive attitude towards those people. And the same thing with Brexit. That, um, I mean, obviously, the establishment was taken aback by the vote for Brexit. And I think that just did disclose the gap there was between the elite's thinking on matters concerning the EU and so many ordinary people's thinking. And I think th the elite has been at fault in treating ordinary people's thinking on things like migration or wanting to recapture sovereignty or that kind of thing, of dismissing that with contempt um, as just sheer ignorance. And I think that is a mistake. I think maybe if they attended a little more carefully to that and taken a, a little more account of that, it may have been we, hadn't, we wouldn't end up with Brexit. That I think there's some, some of the fault for the referendum results perhaps was, stems from both the EU itself, but also uh, from the British political class just being too dismissive of too many people's thinking. So there I'll, I'll finish. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Uh, how closely is uh, Donald Trump tied to the uh, libertarian movement in America, if at all? And do you consider that movement to be populist in any way, shape, or form? Thank you. This is why I, I began by saying I'm a political philosopher, not a political scientist. <laughs> I, I can't claim a, 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 you know, an academic knowledge of America. Um, I mean, my impression is that ideologically, Trump is a very kind of gadfly figure. I don't think he has strong convictions of that kind. Um, I mean, a, a libertarian would ordinarily be. Uh, amongst other things, a kind of free market type fig uh, figure. Um, Trump's opposition to the effects of globalization, his promise to do things for people in the Rust Belt and so on, all imply protectionist measures which will go against the libertarian position. Um, I mean, a true libertarian would also be libertarian on social issues. I don't think those things bother Trump very much, but um, I don't think he'd be libertarian on drugs. I, I just don't... I was going to say sexual issues, but, you know, that's... Uh, <laughs> perhaps we'd better keep off that. Um, uh, I mean, I th I, much of the Tea Party is made up of true libertarian people who want small government... Um, who don't, um, who don't oppose capitalism, but are against kind of capitalists being, being 
patronised by the government. What started the Tea Party movement was the government bailing out banks and um, uh, various other institutions, the insurance industry, the, the car industry and so on. Um, I don't think Trump is necessarily opposed to, to that kind of thing. So I actually don't think there's much of a connection. You know, um, do you know the name Robert Notzik? I mean, he um, was writing back in the early 70s, but has been the best theoretician of, of libertarianism. Um, and and he's, he's the, he is the truth, true article, as it were. I just don't think for a moment Trump has um, uh, really has any kind of principled commitment to that. I, I think he saw an opportunity. Um, he did manage to identify people's concerns. He tapped something which other people, including in the, in the Republican Party, didn't recognize and got to power that way. But I, 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 mean, I think he is, uh, as well as sort of acting disrespectfully political correctness, probably also contemptuous of it. But I, I don't think really there's much of a, a link there. I think he's very much a political opportunist, frankly. Thanks, that was really interesting. Um, I think your last sentence there kind of linked to the question I wanted to ask. Um, how much do you think uh, populist leaders in general actually believe their own position and their own rhetoric? And how much do you think <laughs> it is um, seeing an opportunity to come to power? Because I think in your talk you mentioned that often if power is actually gained, things change. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. The question was really how far do populist leaders, as well, mean what they say, and how far are they rhetoricians, as well, saying the right things to gain themselves political power. And of course, you might ask that of any politician, not the, the, the populist. I guess it's because populism is kind of associated with demagoguery, um, with whipping up feelings and so on, sometimes the, 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 the less savoury feelings amongst humanity. And I find this difficult to answer in a, in a general kind of way. Um, I mean, take somebody like Chavez. You know, again, I, I, I cannot pretend to know a great deal about Chavez and, and even less about other Latin American regimes. My impression is uh, he was somebody from a, a humble background, um, made his way through the army, uh, got fed up with the way, uh, with the corrupt use of political power in Venezuela, staged a coup uh, with a bunch of other people, that fell, but actually managed to get back and had another, and, and then got power legitimately, and used his position to um, use the, largely the oil wealth of Venezuela to uh, really help the poor out, um, increase equality, diminish poverty and so on in, in Venezuela. And I find it hard to believe that um, he, he did that for anything other than his beliefs that uh, you know, that was a better society, that was a better Venezuela, and his antipathy towards the United States and international capitalism, again, that seemed to be generated by his genuine belief that was an obstacle to, to improving the lot of the Venezuelan people. Um, now, the question is how you go about that. And uh, I think his use, a, a lot of the, the rhetoric probably was a means to an end. So I think he believed in the end, whether all that he said is a means of getting to that end, he, he, I'm not sure. And of course, it did go along with a lot of things that people criticised. You know, reading a bit about this, people divide very much on a character like Chavez. I mean, some people think he was the real deal of true social and so on. A really good, other people thought he was uh, authoritarian, he was really um, uh, you know, quite careless, of, not careless is the wrong word, quite dismissive of human rights types concerned. Um, uh, he perhaps villainized the middle classes more than was, was ever justified and so on. Um, and again, you wonder how far that was, was a means to an end. But uh, I mean, then take a character like Nigel Farage. Um, and again, I, I really think Nigel Farage was a true believer. I, I don't think, I mean, he never got political power and he wasn't very much very likely to do it, but you know, what motivation would he have had 
if he hadn't wanted to get out of the EU and, and all that he thought that involved. Um, I mean, I suppose one might say, well, he did it for the buzz. And, you know, one interesting subject is the psychology of politicians. You know, most of us don't become politicians. So why do those who become politicians do so? And are they like the rest of them? And there are people who have elaborate psychological theories about all sorts of inner drives these people are, uh, are pushing them on. Again, there's reason to be sceptical about that. Um, Yeah, I mean, uh, I well, then you get a character like Berlusconi. Um, I mean, in his case, I really do think it, it's for the glory of the office. And I would say that rather more, more similarly about Trump. I think, you know, opportunities as politicians just like the idea of being in charge and, and, and like the idea of having power. So I think it's a variable story. Um, but I'm not sure that there's any reason to suppose any greater insincerity uh, amongst populist politicians and perhaps um, ordinary politicians, even though in some cases insincerity is a rather unlikable character. You know, some of the populist leaders in, in Europe are pretty unsavory characters. Keir Wilders, for example, or um, Viktor Orban in Hungary and so on. But I. I'm pretty certain they believe what they say. Any other questions? Come over back there. My question kind of follows on from what you've just said, actually, because I'm, I'm flabbergasted in some of the things that you're um, attributing to Trump in the ability for him to actually believe his rhetoric and, and go ahead with that without, without really discussing um, the um, manipulation of him by people around him, like Bannon, for example, and I was going to ask clearly, what, where in your model is the, uh, the place for the puppet, um, that figurehead at the front end who's actually been controlled by people behind him? I'm not sure the puppet is the right... I mean, look, don't forget, it's Trump who chooses the people who he puts around him. Um, definitely they're, they're an influence, but I mean, I, I don't... Uh, I'm not persuaded that Trump is just a, 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 a kind of vulnerable doll that uh, it just it does what people tell him to do. Uh, like, you know, he was a, sort of a child king being ruled by a regent. Um, and that's not to say the circle around him isn't important. I mean, where I would see a clear example of that is George Bush and the neocons he surrounded him. I think Bush really was much more of a rather, rather unintelligent uh, individual who, who was pushed around by people around him and uh, I mean, to some extent it was, of course again he selected the people he surrounded himself with but um, I think it was more at their mercy because he had less grey matter than let's say somebody like Barack Obama or, or, or Clinton. Um, I mean my impression of these populist figures is that they, they, they don't strike me as it, I mean as far as I know about them as people who are those sort of wet dummies who just get I mean, certainly there'll be hangers-on, partly because they just think in the same way, or perhaps because they've got to get something out of it. But, um, you know, the best of them don't seem to me to fit this model of somebody, they're just suckers who are being used by other people. But I'm, I'm sorry, that's just very... I think it's what one would need to do to answer that question properly is look at a whole series of figures and in detail and see what was the case. And I'm just not in a position to do that. I mean, he, he, take Nigel Farage, who we all know rather better. I just don't think uh, he was a lapdog of Paul Nuttall and, 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 uh, and um, uh, the others around him. Uh, Paul Theresa May, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, She's not, definitely not populist, but I think she was. Uh, but, well, but in a sense, in a way, the kind of, it was her own fault. She made herself a victim of her own advisers. But, uh, but I don't think that's particularly... Uh, I, well, I'm sorry, I can't say anything usefully beyond that, I think, really. In what ways do you see the media in all its forms? Speak up, Kate. Sorry. Stand up. Oh. <laughs> in what ways do you see the media 
um, in all its various forms, actually sort of influencing the way that populism, you know, develops and, and operates? I think it can be very important. Um, I mean, sometimes the media is more sensitive than politicians. We've got to think they've got to sell their newspapers. So I'm talking about the print media at the moment. Yeah, I'm also thinking of, of, of social media, but yes, go on. Yeah. Um, I mean, the print media have got to sell their newspapers, and therefore they want to say things their readers want to read. This is one of the problems with the... the the, the, the papers and their readers, chicken and egg, um, does the Daily Mail, for example, shape what its readers think and the Sun, but also the Guardian, or is what the Sun and the Mail and the Guardian write determined by their readers, because the readers want... So it's... It, but um, it does seem to me... Um, I mean, papers can be more gung-ho pursuing a populist cause. I think politicians very often have to be far more circumspect. Um, I think with the electronic media in this country, we're, we're fortunate. I mean, you, you can't say that with BBC, nor I think of ITV, but you think of Fox News. I've only seen a limited amount of that in America, but it's diabolical. Social media, I'm afraid I'm just too old to comment. I mean, I'm, in all honesty, I just... Uh, I've, come along too late to get into all that sort of stuff. I don't tweet, I don't, I'm not even on Facebook. Uh, I read blogs and various things I get on the internet, but I'm just not, I, I'm completely, the, the world of the young, uh, and particularly so what happened in the last election, that's completely an unknown world to me, and I just know about it through what is said on the radio, on Radio 4 and on BBC One about it. Um, but I, you know, you can see how it would have massive potential. I mean, given that, um, you know, I, I, th I think, you know, again, we're back to the sort of, sort of the argument of um, does the populist leader create his following? Does he cause people to think in the way he, or it could be she does? Um, or uh, is it working the other way around? Um, I've said, you know, there's very few genuine bottom-up move, populist movements. They tend to be leaders um, making them happen. But with social media, I think you have more and more potential for that bottom-up thing. And I believe the Tea Party, the, the social media has been quite important in the emergence and the continuance of the Tea Party. So, and it was very important in um, uh, the, the Occupy movement, which is sometimes such as a kind of grassroots recent um, left-wing form of populism. So I think potentially it could, could be, yeah, it could be very important. Alice? Well, actually, my question was going to be about uh, that very thing, the influence of um, the um, press and television um, on populism. Nigel Farage wouldn't have got anywhere near what he did without um, the support of um, certain newspapers. I'm quite sure of that. And as, as for social media, I can tell you, old though I am, that it did in this last election make a huge uh, difference. And I don't think that you could think of Jeremy Corbyn as being a populist leader because people, papers and the television to a certain extent, kept telling everybody he wasn't a leader. To which my answer is, Ian Duncan Smith. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I mean, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, um, it's so hard to talk in generalities all the time. I mean, I, I don't dissent from what you say about social media at all. I mean, I don't know otherwise, and people have been saying this, so, you know, the, the world is, is going beyond me. Um, it's just very hard to know uh, how much influence the newspapers have. Um, but I... I, and they must have made, if you take what, what you might call the establishment, um, 
the establishment in terms of politicians, leaders, leaders of industry, um, the intelligence and so on, they were so very much on the side of Remain. Um, and I think when you compare that, the press, by contrast, wasn't. So if, if the Brexiteers got support from anything other than themselves, I'm sure the, the press did make a difference. It's very difficult to know quite how much difference it made. I mean, I, I would be sceptical of saying that, that Farage was tremendously important in, in this and the press as well. They made people think in that way. Uh, I think people just aren't that passive. And I, I think what they did was tap into a grain of discontent to concerns um, that have been around for a long time um, and, and uh, caught the establishment by, by surprise. But it's just... Uh, this is the kind of thing where you really need to, need to do empirical research, but it's the sort of empirical research it's very hard to do. How on earth do you find out how much influence the press actually had? It's extremely difficult to... You know, this is the kind of thing that social scientists do and want to be social scientists. Um, quite right, too, but it's very, very hard to pin this down objectively. So I'm sorry, that's the best I can do. <laughs> Can I, by the way, uh, invite people just to express views, um, as you did? I mean, I don't want to pretend to be the only person who's got an opinion or worth hearing on the issue. Hello. Uh, I've got a humdinger of a question for you. I have no idea whether you're going to be able to answer it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. In your view, can the rise of populism in the modern Western world ever help to create the right circumstances for the end of neoliberal capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a hard job, I think. It's, um, uh, it's very hard to see it doing that. Um, um, neoliberalism is such a dominant economic form in the entire globe, pretty much. It's, I mean, it's hard to think of a global, there being a global populist movement that could match it. And there were, I mean, that globe, there were these global protests, weren't there? Or, or I forgot what they were called now, the global activists, some, some years ago. And they just seemed to have, I don't know whether they don't get reported now, but they don't seem to be about in the same kind of way. But I mean, the kind of populism we've had has been very nation-based. Um, as I mentioned, in the case of Chavez and some of the, the Latin American countries, it's be been very um, anti-American. And, um, and of course, <laughs> uh, in a way, as I was saying before, some of Trump's ideas are anti-neoliberal, leaving things just to the market. Um, but then you've got the European Union, which is itself, on the whole, a neoliberal-driven institution. Um, and you have, yeah, populists. I mean, Euroscepticism uh, is, to some extent, driven by a reaction against that, particularly in the case of Greece and Spain, those countries which suffered and, uh, the, when the crisis in the Euro. Um, I suppose the short answer is no, I can't see how the hell that's going to happen. But none of us can see the future and the way the world's going to change. Uh, I mean, that, I mean that, you know, that really is the big problem, I think, of our age. That, um, you know, we're living in, now in, in the global village, uh, to use a cliche. You know, our world is affected by things outside of our four shores all the time now. Uh, there's this stuff about you know multinationals having much more control than, than, than most governments and so on, um, but we don't have political institutions that match that. I mean, the, all right, the EU is there, but it's um, it's just just Europe. It's not even all of Europe. Um, there's the UN, but the UN is hopeless, frankly, on that score because and quite understandably because the UN is a club of nation states. And they're all generous of their power, and they're, and they're not willing to allow the UN to become this kind of cosmopolitan government. Um, you know, in my subject area, there's been an awful lot of talk of global democracy, cosmopolitan democracy. 
but it, it is mainly talk, and it's very hard to see how the hell you could ever get that to operate. I mean, could you really think of the entire population of the world as acting like a kind of democratic assembly? And when you think of the differences there are in the world between different societies, how differently they think, could you ever have some kind of majority rule? I mean, could you see um, Iran being governed by what we decide in the West, and could you see the West ever being governed by what's decided by Iran and other countries in the Middle East? So. Um, it's as though it's sort of Marx's worst nightmare, I suppose, in a sense, in that you have this sort of international economic system that that's nobody can properly control, and, and it's, very, it's very difficult to see how you have political institutions that are workable that could ever do that, but um, so I'm afraid that's a rather dark answer. Can we have one last question from Ed? This is the last question, I guess it makes sense. Can you give us some examples of how populism ends? Has it always you know, fizzle out from internal contradictions or do, do external circumstances changes, change that stops this uh, you know, illiberal thing um, from bubbling up? Thank you. Uh, actually, um, I think... I guess there must be a, a variety of things. Um, I mean, think of Chavez. Well, well, the poor man died of a heart attack in 2013, but by that stage, the, the oil price was already going down, and the, the thing collapsed, and that brought to an end. I mean, he's, you still have um, his successor in power. I've forgotten his name now, uh, Norberto. Doesn't matter anyway. But um, that brought Chavez's uh, socialist system crashing down, and poverty now is worse than it was before he took over. So I think sometimes circumstances take over. Um, I think sometimes these things just lose momentum. Um, I mean, UKIP obviously has. On the other hand, you might say, well, that's because it's, it's achieved its goal, but that, that is uh, rare. Um, I think also, I think perhaps these populist parties, they do depend very much on a sense of crisis, a sense of popular concern. And if the sense of crisis goes, then as well, their relevance seems to disappear as well. I mean, sometimes it can be that they take, they do get power, and they're, as it were, tamed by power. I mean, I don't know how far Trump will be tamed. But, I mean, there is some, or in some measure, he's, he's stepping back from what he said. Um, and I, I do not see how he's going to deliver on some of the things he promised, and if he fails, he'll be voted out. Um, so I, I think there are a variety of things. I think... I mean, maybe it's in the nature of populism that's evanescent, that it depends upon, you know, passing anxieties, passing concerns. It, it's not, you know, as I say, it's a very thin ideology. It's just about the people against the elite, and therefore it's not sustained by a body of belief in the way that things like Marxism or liberalism or whatever uh, are sustained. Um, so I think it is very prey to circumstances. Perhaps that's, that's the answer.